Oh, good to be back, Dave. We're we're in kind of a shitstorm here, yeah. and and it's something that uh, about a month ago I wrote a public article about how the fuse was going to be rising ten year bond yield, and I I think that proved to be correct. We we moved toward three point zero percent on the ten year, and uh, that triggered a lot of automatic selling. And when you read financial rags like uh, New York Times and Wall Street Journal. They don't talk a lot about what triggered this, but rising bond yields are triggering this. And then you got to look at, well, what triggered the rising bond yield? What triggered bond sales? And I think it's been a few different factors. Like it, it's now becoming apparent the U.S. government debt is going way past 20 trillion and we can never pay it back. That, that is a crossing the Rubicon event. <clears throat> But but I think also the foreign dumping of treasuries, like to finance the uh, Belt and Road Initiative and all the projects, um, like like countries disgusted with QE and the Zimbabwe type monetary inflation going on to finance U.S. government deficits. You you can't monetize the U.S. government debt and expect the world to hold on to their treasuries. Can't do that. So a lot of factors are coming, bond dumping and uh, debt problems looking unresolvable. And and I think we're also seeing the effect of, of some of the rising, uh, not rising rates, uh, what do you call it? So the sequence of rate hikes is finally starting to bite. But it might be biting in a hidden way, Dave. It might be biting with the derivatives. That, that's what I think is going on right now. The derivatives are combining with foreign dumping while the confidence in the dollar from debt growth is getting out of control. And it's becoming a perfect storm for the U.S. dollar vis-a-vis -vis its financial structure. Now, I mean, we have China where they have issued the Petro Yuan. We see a lot of countries moving away from the dollar. And we see the Belt and Road, and there's about, what, like 70 countries that have joined up to the Belt and Road. Including England. Including England. And we can see everything is shifting now, and it has been shifting for a while, from the west to the east. Now, as this continues on, what happens to the dollar? What happens to the confidence of the dollar? I mean, I mean, is this going to have a, an incredible effect on what is happening here in the U.S.? Well, yeah, because one of the... One of the events down the road with certainty is to some extent the dollar is going to lose its universal global currency reserve status. <clears throat> I think where we're heading is a dual universe. Uh, and I've explained this a few times. I've been explaining this ever since about October or November. We're going to be moving toward two spheres, two universes on planet Earth. The global economy is going to have a portion, small portion, but growing with the Chinese RMB used for construction projects, payments, used for commodity purchases like oil and, you know, whatever grains, um, and used more and more in banking. Okay. That's one side. And the other side is going to be the dollar sphere. And that's going to be, you know, the, the majority of the global economy still. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> Western Europe, South America, Central America, United States, Canada, England, they're going to continue with the dollar. And all the nations that are too afraid to move away from the dollar for fear of being attacked, labeled terrorists, rogue states, victim of sanctions, you know, object of, of war, they're going to continue with the dollar, but they're going to be making behind the scenes preparations for the Chinese RMB. That's where we're moving. We're, we're to the point now where the dollar no longer, I mean now, no longer has the monopoly as global currency reserve. It's just not the case anymore. But you can't say that, oh gosh, it, it's under half. No, it's over half, but it's not a monopoly. It's probably something like 80 to 90 percent. But that 10 or 20 percent is growing and it's got a lot more legitimacy because they're not relying on machines to uh, generate bond demand like we are. I mean, gosh, we got trillion dollar deficit with treasuries, Dave, and very, very few buyers. So why is not our bond 
long-term maturity, why is it not like Greece was near 10%? Because we've got the interest rate swap machinery and all those derivatives working behind the scenes. Well, guess what? It depends on 0% feeder system, and we're taking that away. This is so dangerous. The main buyer for treasury bonds is at risk now because of rising interest rates. I mean, like the short-term rate, the Fed funds, the three-month, the six-month, the 12-month, they're all jumping, and that's the feeder cost for the interest rate swap derivatives. So maybe what we're seeing behind the scenes not so visibly, but we see the effect, is that the treasuries for the 10-year are selling off because the machinery is breaking down. Now, I, I, I don't have a lot of faith in saying they're breaking down and it's getting to be a total mess. No, I think they've got a, a lot of machinery at work, a lot of fail-safe software, a lot of backup systems that have been tested over the years during many crises, including 2000 and 2008. But every time they do a rate hike, Dave, they do something slippery behind the scenes, whether it's uh, working with reverse repos or whether it's changing the, the interest rate on, on excess reserves. They play games to try to remove the rate hike for the big players. But I think it's getting tougher and tougher. Now you've got this new guy, Powell, replacing Janet Yellen at the Fed. Powell is not one of their boys. So I think they're I think they're getting ready for a magnificent decline in US stocks and bonds. And if they have to save one, they're going to save bonds, which means they're going to let the stock market go, which means that a lot of people are going to get frightened because their pensions or their 401k's, IRAs are in trouble. And I know some people who are in you know, very heavy sweats back in 2008 and nine, And they stopped sweating because the stock market went up. It tripled. We're working toward the dual universe, Dave, and that's where we're going. And that's where the gold standard is going to be reintroduced on the eastern side. And then you're going to have eastern currencies gold-backed competing with the dollar backed by debt by war and by fraud. So you're saying that the gold stand, I mean, is this going to be hooked to what currency? China's currency, the SDR, what are they going to be backing? I think if China starts backing their dollar, you're going to start hearing things from Basel for a gold-backed SDR, uh, the special drawing rights, uh, the basket of the IMF, the five currency basket, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the British pound, and now the RMB from China, which gathered about 10% weight. Uh, if China does something, the West will do something regarding backing a currency with gold. And it's going to be very fun to watch the Basel, Switzerland entry, uh, because they're going to try to do everything the same as they had before. Centralize, no transparency a lot of heavy-handed orders, and things just won't have the confidence behind them. Uh, I, I think we're going to see a day pretty soon where Basel makes an announcement and says, if you want to participate in global trade, you need to send us your gold so you can participate. Centralize the gold uh, repository function. I mean, it'll take a, a, company, a country like Bolivia. They sell a lot of industrial metal. They receive a bunch of Chinese finished products of whatever type. And if they want to continue to trade, they're going to have to. Uh, this is what I think Basel is going to do. They're going to tell Bolivia, you got to send your gold to us and we'll take care of it for you. It'll be perfectly safe. But I don't think many countries are going to believe that because they've seen what the Americans, Swiss and British have done. They've engaged in colossal financial criminal behavior. It's going to be fun to watch. It can be dangerous, but it'll be interesting. So right now we have this global debt problem. The U.S. has a huge amount of debt and oil prices are at its lowest point, you know, in many, many years. And we see gold every time it takes a move. It's, you know, there's thousands upon thousands of contracts that are thrown at it. 
to be brought down. I mean, if, if the dollar is being abandoned by all these countries and countries are moving away from the dollar, will gold prices have to move up at this time? That is the big question. Um, I like describing it in a different way. The dollar has its trouble. We've got our treasury bond problem. We got our deficit problem. We got the debt rollover problem. We have the borrowing cost problem. We have foreign dumping problem. What is coming next is the East wrestling control of the gold market. They're just going to take control of it. Um, they're realizing that the Achilles heel, the big vulnerability of, of the United States, the dollar, the, the Western Europeans, the British, their big vulnerability is the dollar, the treasury bond and the debt, financing the debt, rolling over the debt. China tried to solve things. Remember back in 2000 and uh, I think it was 12, there was there was QE and then there was QE2 and then there was Operation Twist under Bernanke. Well, that, that's not really recalled much, but I bring it up because it's very important. Uh, the Chinese wanted to dump their long-term 10 and 30-year treasuries and hold one, two, and five-year treasuries so they could mature, so they get paid and not reinvest. That's not dumping. It's just taking your money to the win at the, you're taking your bond at the window and saying, I want my money. It's matured. Thank you. It's like, you know, my, when I was a little kid, I used to buy these, uh, now they were silly, but they're kind of fun. They were cute. Uh, the U.S. savings bonds. Okay. You, you pay, I don't exactly remember, something like you pay something like $82 and in five years you collect your hundred because the interest accrues and it becomes part of your original principal and grows up to be a hundred. And when it matures, you take your hundred. Well, there's no forcible repurchase of other savings bonds. That's what China did. They converted from long to short term. China is going to wrest control. I said wrestle. They're going to wrest control, take control, seize control of the gold market because their final piece is finally in place. The final piece is buying gold with oil and then paying for oil in RMB. It completes the triangle. <clears throat> I believe, I'm not sure. But I believe we're going to see in later in March uh, a, a deal, a, a launch, where we finally have the triangle complete. They're going to make the petro yuan. Per, it's going to be a contract for purchasing oil in RMB. It completes the triangle. Oil, RMB, and gold. The, the Russians have been taking payment for quite a while in RMB. And they, they go straight to uh, Shanghai and they convert to gold. And they got a bank, Sverbank. With the Beijing office, it opened up only a couple of years ago. That's to take gold. So the Russians are basically selling China oil and gas for gold. It's a short trip that they're taking to convert the RMB paid for gold. And then they come up with these just incredibly funny and stupid stories about uh, China and Russia increasing their official uh, quantity of gold on reserves. Yeah, well... They can talk about a thousand tons all they want, but the the truth is more like thirty thousand tons. Coos Jansen is not the only analyst to verify that. The Voice has actually seen the twenty five thousand tons of gold under the Kremlin. He's seen it in the nineteen ninety decade. Walked past them, looked at them, touched them, got permission. He was working on some consulting project for I don't know. I think it was Yeltsin. <clears throat> Nielsen went away. Long story. Not going to get into that. But um, I think the Chinese are going to just seize control of the gold market. The biggest curiosity I have is after the Chinese go ahead and and sell gold and deliver gold, a unique concept, deliver the metal. Once they do that, the big issue is going to be where is all the gold being sourced from that's being delivered in Shanghai? And I don't have a, a solid answer to that. I have suspicions. <clears throat> I believe the Chinese do not want to see a drainage of their gold reserves, supplies, inventories, whatever you want to call it. They're not going to just let the West operate for a few years at a suppressed, corrupted, low price, 
where they drain China of its gold. China's not that stupid. I think China's cutting a deal. A little while ago, this is about a year ago, Basel, Switzerland, made a statement that they're not going to supply the gold market via London anymore with gold. Vatican was asked, what are you doing? What's your status? And they said, uh, we have no change. They don't even want people to know they got gold. So they're not going to talk about halting or continuing gold supply to London. They're just going to avoid the question. So what I'm wondering is, did China cut a deal? And that's why the delays are there for the Petro One. The, uh, the RMB purchases of oil, that contract in Shanghai. Is there delay after delay for that? Because China knows that it completes the gold triangle for oil and RMB. <clears throat> Since they don't have an assurance of Western channels in addition to their own for the gold supply. That's what I think is going on. So let me just get this straight. You're, what you're saying is China and Russia they're going to be basically forcing or pushing the world back to some type of standard. I, I think so. I, I think they're going to uh, try to get away from the dollar. And the first thing you do in that procedure is move to the RMB. The RMB will be used more for trade. And they're going to try to do a little bit more internationalization of, of the uh, Chinese government bonds for use in reserves. I mean, when they got the SDR permission through the IMF uh, to use 10% of the SDR uh, as ratios for SDR provision, they needed to supply either currency or bonds to the IMF, which is basically run by the, the Basel Bunch. Okay, well, there's not a whole lot of internationally floating Chinese government bonds. So th they've got a problem. The United States doesn't have that problem. We got trillions in treasury bond supply, and we try to call that all wealth. I remember when it was the 80s, and there used to be a nasty joke running around the United States. You're as rich as the credit that you can access. And I thought, well, that's pretty stupid. What happens when you have a problem? Oh, no, no. And just borrow more. Okay, it's insane the way the United States has gone. Everything's upside down. Our banks have reserve assets that are debt. Since what is debt an asset? That's an Al Capone ticket, a chip. What do they call it? A, not a tab. They have a, a word. Uh, gosh, the mafia uses a word. Um, not a tag. I can't think of it. Uh, marker. The mafia has a marker on that. Okay, well, you can't put markers in your banks. Well, gosh, the United States is so upside down. We not only use debt securities in our bank reserves, we use heroin packets for overnight reserves. I was told a few years ago, don't mention that. But, you know, it's getting kind of late in the game. And heroin is a big story now about Afghanistan, our management of it. You know, flooding northern Iran with Afghan heroin. Now the Russians and Chinese want to go in there and install some peace in Afghanistan. And the big ancillary question is, what happens to all the American heroin business? Now you got a problem in Ohio with all the opioid overdoses. And last year, 2017, they had 80 million prescriptions filled for opioids in Ohio alone with an 11, 12 million population, which means every man, woman and child in Ohio had an average of seven opioid prescriptions during the year, which is insane. OK, so the heroin story is out of the bag. <clears throat> I think I think China is going to rest control. And a lot of consequences are going to come from that. We, we still have one problem here. We still have this debt. I mean, the United States, you know, the debt is continually moving higher and higher every single day. The global debt is moving high. Even the central banks are out there. The bank of central banks, the biz, are saying that this is unsustainable. What do they do with it? They just write it off. And I, I don't think they will because central bankers don't like to write off debt. What do they do with all this debt? Okay, this... this comes to my main point for the day. I think the Basel Bunch, Bank for International Settlement, BIS, you call it biz, I call it BIS, same thing. Uh, I think they're going to come to a conclusion that the dollar has run its course. It's been defended now by war. Uh, it's been defended by bond fraud. It's being defended by QE and machinery with interest rate swaps, derivatives. It's now being defended in desperate ways 
and the interest rates are rising, which undermine the feeder system to the interest rate swap derivatives. They require the 0% to produce unlimited bond demand for the long-term maturities. And that's being taken away. Now, bear in mind that every time they do an interest rate hike at the Fed in the last couple of years, there's been a little trick behind the scenes. The first time it was uh, adjusting the reverse repo, which meant that they were actually taking cash from the Wall Street banks and giving them treasury bonds with permission to raise their leverage to just something like 100 to 1 and increase the leverage while increasing the volume. That's like having a Sears Tower in Chicago, an extra 50 stories high, but just to make things clever and showing off, they reduce the footprint from the lobby and the foundation. Okay, so you got a higher tower with a smaller base. That's very unstable in high winds, and financial market turmoil is qualified high winds. So they're taking away the feeder system that's free for the interest rate swap derivatives, while the global community of nations is losing confidence in the dollar. And the same community of nations is concluding, my gosh, you're 20 trillion now at 20 and a half. You're going to be 21 and a half in a year. You're never going to pay this back. You're seeing news headlines almost every day from around the world somewhere that says the growing U.S. government deficits have become a problem. This is new. You didn't get that two years ago. So that undermines confidence in the dollar, which undermines confidence and permission for the continued privilege in the global currency reserve. That's why I think we're going to be moving toward this dual universe. And it's not going to be a situation where the United States says, well, any country that signs up with the RMB and the, and the uh, Belt and Road Initiative with all the projects and uses their CIPS alternative to SWIFT, we're going to attack you. We're going to invade you. We're going to steal your central bank gold. We're going to sanction your ass. No, that's not going to happen this time because Germany might be among them. <laughs> hmm. Oh, gosh. We're going to lose too many allies in the next round. We're going to have to share the global currency reserve privilege. And it's going to be with what I call the caretaker Chinese RMB currency. Why do I call it a caretaker? Because it's eventually going to become gold backed. And the first, I've been saying this for quite a while, over a year, the first introduction to the gold standard will be in gold, I'm sorry, will be in trade payment done with the gold trade note. Trade payment. Okay, you hear article after article all over the place now. The emerging markets and the East, the undeveloped world, is now with a greater economy than the developed West. Because we've had three decades of exporting our industrial base. Sri Lanka is getting big. I mean, that's just one example. These nations in the East and emerging markets are getting critical mass. They've got a big slice of the global population. They've got a near 50% proportion. I think it's like 40, 42%. Depends on how you define the emerging market and undeveloped world. But at least 40% of the global economy is from these nations, not the industrialized West, like France, Canada, U.S. Uh, I, I laugh at the world, developed world, because the industrialized nations, like the United States and France, they've de-industrialized in the last 30 years. They exported their industrial base. Germany didn't. How are they doing? They're doing just fine. They just have to deal with the Arab human garbage that Brussels EU commissioners insist on letting in and giving welfare and forgiving their crimes. Okay, that's that's a big challenge in Germany right now. It's a million Arab garbage units entering per year, uneducated, poor, and not too willing to work in the factories either. And they want their own laws and they want their own churches. <clears throat> not going to go over. Well. Oh, it's all part of the Pike Plan from 1897. <clears throat> okay, where are we going? We're going to the point where the central banks of the world, are, of our planet Earth, 
um, are going to say the dollar has run its course and a new solution is needed because 2008 happened. We didn't fix anything and we're not going to go through the same thing all over again because we really can't. The central banks, principally the Fed and the Euro Central Bank, have used up all their ammunition. We can't go the same route again. We can't have a crisis and, and print a lot of money to save the system, have the bank steal it again with impunity, and then go to infinite QE because sovereign bonds are now in trouble on the confidence side. We can't do that again. So I think <clears throat> we're going to get to a point, Dave, where the central banks say, we have to go to the gold solution because we got too much debt. We have debt that has fixed our debt problems, and now we have too much debt, we have no solution of applying more debt because we've already done that, it didn't work. The, the Europeans have a saying about the Americans, they, <clears throat> they'll do all the wrong things until they exhaust all the wrong solutions, then they'll finally do the right thing. We're now at the point where the Americans have to do the right thing, but we're in a box. The US has at least a $600 billion trade deficit working this year. We're really breaking the records. We're, we're way ahead of the $550 billion from last year in the trade deficit. If you just look at the trade deficit, Dave, and you don't even look at the federal deficit of a trillion, the, the trade deficit would require, even at $550 billion in volume, would require over 13,000 tons of gold to be lost at a rough $1,300 gold price. 13,000 tons of gold in just the first year. Or well, what about the second year? Another 13,000 or more because we have not reindustrialized as Trump promised in his campaign. Well, why didn't we do that? Because we decided to increase the military budget. <clears throat> We're doing all the wrong things. We're not even approaching the solutions. So the rest of the globe, the community of nations, is going to dismiss the dollar. They don't want the war anymore. They don't want the fraud anymore. They don't want the derivative support to monetize the debt anymore. So they're joining up with China, which I think has promised them access to gold for usage in the gold trade note, which will replace the treasury bill in trade payment as a standard. I'm watching for the big event. The big event that I see on the horizon is coming, it's being hinted, it's being floated, being debated, and it's being threatened. It's the Chinese buying Saudi oil and paying an RMB. In Qatar, they're already buying from China. China's already buying oil and gas from Qatar and paying an RMB. The precedent has already been set. But Saudi is special because that is the vassal state for Washington. So don't don't we have a problem here in the United States? You're talking about uh, gold having a currency that's backed by gold. Well, I mean, Mnuchin was out there and he went to you know Fort Knox and he showed us that you know one bar we we have gold. Don't worry. But many people say that there there is no gold now. If well, there is there is. It's just a very minimal amount. Uh, I asked The Voice several months ago, am I correct? Just tell me yes or no. Am I correct in saying Fort Knox has no gold? Because George of the Comics has a friend who's been in charge of the security contract and protection of Fort Knox for many years. And he passed word to George, my jackass colleague, that Fort Knox is loaded with nerve gas. It is a warehouse of nerve gas. They replaced the gold with nerve gas. Well, here's what the voice said. He said, yeah, it's a nerve gas warehouse. But, Jim, be careful when you use the word none, because it's not true that there's none. They have two barrels of legacy gold coins. I mean, like beer barrels. You know, the 80-gallon uh, beer, <laughs> beer barrel. Right. Well, here's some trivia for you. What does the word Cuba mean in Spanish? <laughs> barrel. Their country is named Barrel because the island is shaped like a narrow barrel. Anyway, <clears throat> the two barrels of legacy gold coins at Fort Knox are worth something on the order of a couple billion dollars. Whereas 
the 8,500 tons were worth around 500 to 550 billion dollars. But that's all gone. I think it's all gone. I don't even want to talk about where it went. It's important to know that it's almost all gone, way over 99 percent gone. I don't care if they got a couple barrels. They're they're cute and nothing more. They're not functional. They're they're a sideshow item for Moochin when he goes in. <clears throat> you know, Moochin's a movie director, so he directed a movie that day when he said there's gold in there. Yeah, there is. Two barrels worth about two billion. Nothing more. Well, we're going to have a challenge. We need two things. We can't just go with a gold standard in, in the U.S. for the dollar. We can't do that. We need at the same time to reindustrialize because we need 30 to 50,000 new businesses every year for several years with an export emphasis. We need to get rid of this trade deficit. The Rockefeller Institute advised in the 1980s to export our industry to offshore manufacturing with a design of economic suicide. It's part of their plan. The Rockefellers have an agenda to wreck the United States. They did a good job. They had an agenda to interfere with the food supply, introduce corn syrup everywhere, and permit advertising of pizza everywhere, so that now we have 60% obesity. They've accomplished their mission of wrecking the United States. Why would they want to do that? Because it interferes with the global fascist state plan. The United States needs to reindustrialize, get lots and lots of companies in free trade zones in all 50 states, export their faces off, and you're not going to see high wages or ample fringe benefits. You're just going to see steady jobs. You're probably going to see a number of Chinese managers also. And we need a gold standard. But the gold standard cannot fly until we reindustrialize. We haven't even begun. So you're talking about taking the U.S. the way we have it today. And as everything is shifted towards this gold standard, the U.S. is going to lose out because, first, we don't have any gold. We have no manufacturing. So, in effect, all those third world countries, uh, the emerging market, they are going to become the industrialized countries and the U.S. is going into a third world type of country like they were. Yeah, that's exactly. And it's going to be very strange for the Americans to adapt to this. And the result for those who are very well trained and who are somewhat wealthy, the attraction for them will be to leave. And when you say the, the attraction will be to leave, why? Because their wealth might be confiscated to feed the poor in the third world, the United States. I mean, you, you got lots of quotes, like from Nancy Pelosi, talking about, oh gosh, you know, if we were to let that, we would lose all the income for our socialist programs. Well, she doesn't use those words, but that's her point. Many of our congressional leaders believe that it is their right to take money from the citizens in order to handle the poor, because the poor are their constituency. Why did Obama bring in thousands of Somalis and Africans? He told them all, oh, vote Democrat. If you want to retain your welfare, you must vote Democrat. And they were too ignorant to know it wasn't true. It's going to be a shockwave in the United States when the dollar loses its global currency reserve status. But I've said this, and I'm going to repeat it. We're moving toward a dual universe where the dollar doesn't have global currency monopoly status. It's going to have Western currency reserve status. The French aren't going to change. Italians aren't going to change. Spain's not going to change. The Swedish aren't going to change. They're going to have treasury bonds as their core holding in their banking system and their central banks. But China's not, Russia's not, India's not, Korea might switch, Japan's already in the process of switching, they're working big energy deals with Russia now. We got lots and lots of mega crimes soon to be exposed like the Fukushima 
which was done by the Bush gang. And now China's got a, a tough problem. I'm sorry, Japan. Japan has a tough problem. They need to replace their energy capacity, their electricity supply. So they're turning to Russia for help. Oh, my gosh. So when the dollar loses its monopoly, it's going to have to rely on its machinery with the derivatives for continuing with bond purchases, or else we'll be looking at 5 and 6% on the 10-year bond. Every 1% increase on the average uh, interest rate for borrowing costs for the U.S. Treasury, every 1% now means $205 billion. So they cannot let this get out of control, which, is, as Rob Kirby concludes, they're going to be working overtime to cap the 10-year yield, the TNX. They'll work overtime to control it. But I think they're going to fail. I think they're starting to show evidence of failure now. They can't control it. It's too much volume and too much leverage and therefore too much pressure on the machinery. Maybe they're going to underestimate how many machines they need to work. Maybe they're going to underestimate how many operators at the keyboards and consoles they're going to need. Maybe they're going to underestimate how much dumping will take place by foreign central banks. I think this is just ripe for errors. And I don't think 3% is going to hold. I think we're going to move to 3%. We almost did. It was like 2.9%, 2.91 or 2, and then back down to 28 I think we come down a little bit more now, but I think we go back up and I think we're going to surpass 3% and cause a lot of problems. I got disagreement among my nine jackass colleagues. A few of us think we're going to go over 3% and cause big problems like 20%, 30% stock declines in the, in the, in the uh, major averages. But a couple others like Rob Kirby says, no, you, you don't fully appreciate the exchange stabilization fund run by the Treasury Department. Uh, they've got nearly unlimited bond demand working through their system. And I, and I say, well, it sounds good and you might be right, but I think it, it has too many risks for running without flaws. And I, I named a few. I think we're mo moving toward a situation where the global central banks say, we've had enough of the dollar, we need something new, we need a real solution, and the most painless solution is, is not to drop the oil price and make it f almost free for everybody and not to make free energy for everybody. We need to increase the gold price, encourage central banks to replace their treasury bonds with gold bullion. Then we lift the gold price to 5000 then 8000 then 10000 which will cover the liabilities held by major central banks. If they start converting to treas from treasuries to gold, the United States is going to be kind of isolated, and they won't do that. I don't know what the United States is going to do. I think they're just between a rock and a hard place, and they're getting their nuts cut off. But the foreign central banks are going to work up their reserves in gold and maybe lie about how much they have in treasuries. They're going to continue to dump the treasuries, and get to the point where if gold doubles and triples in price, they're going to be in a manageable situation. Some, I think some central banks are going to go and enter failure. I think some entire national banking systems are going to enter failure. This is a point that The Voice has been making, and I fully subscribe to it. It's just not possible to continue what we've been doing, which is no solution since 08 and the Lehman events. That global financial crisis that emerged out of the subprime mortgage bonds has now become a systemic issue. Whatever we did with the mortgage bonds, we've been doing now with the sovereign bonds. Notice that a year or two ago, the Euro Central Bank decided we're going to start buying corporate bonds. Then a year ago, the Fed announced we're going to be buying stocks. Well, why don't they buy municipal bonds and junk bonds while they're at it? 
So they're trying to monetize and institutionalize the entire bond world. I think it's going to blow up in their faces. The foreign central banks are going to be very well positioned soon. Because I think they're increasing their gold holdings for reserve purposes. They're, 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 there's two nations that are unique right now. One is Germany and one is China. They share something in common. They both import a lot of oil, energy generally, oil and gas. And they both have big trade surpluses. I think they're going to begin to call the shots. Because they're going to be the representatives of the global economy who don't want exorbitant prices for energy. And they're going to want assets to be brought in line with respect to energy. I'm referring to the gold-oil ratio for price. And since they're big creditors from their trade surplus history, they're going to be calling the shots on how reserves are managed and how banking reserves are set up, and it's going to be more gold and less U.S. treasuries. <clears throat> I mean, th there's some old sayings the, the old quotes that are, are from the Basel Bunch in, in Switzerland, Basel, Switzerland, Bank for International Settlements. It talk, they talk about the universal opinion, the consensus opinion, that a lower oil price has caused a lot of problems and, and really exacerbated the global financial crisis that emerged from 2008. And then in their second breath, they say the painless solution is a much higher gold price so that they can have essentially the equivalent of a debt jubilee for the central banks. And this debt jubilee depends critically upon the central banks holding a lot of gold, reducing their treasury bonds, and lifting the gold price multiples higher. If you suddenly see the gold price at 10000 does that really interfere with food prices? No. Does that really interfere with construction prices, costs? No. Does that interfere with operating a car, a truck, a train? No. Transportation is not affected. No. Oil affects most sectors of the economy. Gold does not. The little exception is silver. And, and I get some incorrect opinions floating my way sometimes to say, well, gosh, Jim, if you're right and silver goes up tenfold or twentyfold and you're looking at two and three hundred dollars silver price and gold is a lot higher. But even if you're looking at a two hundred dollar silver price, that's going to wreck a lot of industries. And I say, no, it's not. Will it wreck a, the, the cost of a PC which uses a fraction of an ounce? No. No, the cost will go from $6 to $25. Who cares? $6 to $60. Who cares? Depending on the, the type of uh, uh, type of product and the usage of, of the silver and the substitutes that they can find, whatever. No, it's a small component cost for a lot of different products. Here's the big zinger coming down the line. Uh, I don't know how far we are from it, but there's a replacement for fiber optic technology coming. And if you think about, okay, gosh, we're, we're passing information, data, you know, zeros and ones, on glass, glass fibers. Well, gee, isn't silver better at that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Well, the next generation for fiber optic is silver, silver strands. You can't call it optic. It's not silver optic because there's no light. It's just very fast passage silver strands. The whole world is going to get rewired with silver to replace fiber optic. Gosh, we had a big challenge just in the last 15, 20 years to rewire the world with respect to uh <clears throat> Fiber optic. If uh, you were saying before, if the um, gold price moves up because the foreign central banks, they're ramping up on gold, we're moving towards this gold back type of scenario. 
uh, will the central banks here in the United States still try to manipulate the gold prices or will it get completely out of hand? I think it's going to get completely out of hand. Um, I, I don't think uh, I don't think the, the West, you know, like New York and London, I don't think they're going to be able to defend themselves well when the Chinese start delivering on gold contracts, a novel concept. Uh, imagine buying a television and when you show up at the window, they say, well, you can re you can recycle that for a purchase for June. No, I want my damn television set. I have, I want to watch some sports and movies on TV. Okay. Well, when it's with gold, you got to recycle that. In the way. It's just not going to work anymore. We're going to, I think we're going to start seeing, uh, the Comex price have to compete with the second price. And, and then we get to the point where there's seven prices across the globe. Dubai has a price. London has a price. Zurich has a price. Moscow has a price. New York has a price. And where's the lowest? New York and London. And then you start working the arbitrage and you realize, well, you, you can't even take advantage via arbitrage with the low New York price because they don't deliver anything. You can't buy in New York and sell in China because you don't, you won't walk out of New York with any metal. So the COMEX is going to become irrelevant. Uh, you know, they might continue to sell aluminum and copper, but I, I think the days are numbered where the COMEX sells oil, uh, sells gold and silver. I mean, if gold and silver, if, if, if they're moving up the way you say, wouldn't investors then drop the dollar? I mean, if it moves up to 3000 to 4000 to 5000 forget about the COMEX, they see it other places. Wouldn't they just drop the dollar and say, you know something, why am I in the dollar? That's decreasing. I'd rather be in gold right now. I, I wonder who you mean by there and, and what do you mean by in the dollar? You're talking about, you know, reserves for a bank or are you talking about trade payment or are you talking about you know, your, your grandmother's estate that she wants to have in a good investment. Yeah, talking about investors that are in the stock market, investors that are, you know, on the sidelines, corporations, you know, everyone's saying, well, okay, let me take my funds and, you know, instead of the stock market, this is going up, let me pl place it there and, and you know, reap the benefits from it. I think that's precisely what's going to happen. They're going to see the treasury bond fall in value. They're going to see the the gold price suppressed and soon to be released. So when all this happens, and, and uh, I mean, when, when you're looking, I mean, we're very close now. I see that China um, has been pushing their policies with the one belt, one road, where they're telling their uh, investors not to invest like in Canada, in the housing market anymore, take your funds, put it into the belt and road and they're pulling their investments out of these countries, Australia, Canada, and we see the um, Petro Yuan coming online, the futures market. I mean, it seems like we're very, very close for all of this to happen. I mean, I don't think we're years away from it anymore. I, I think we're closer than that. What do you think? I think we're months away from some severe breakdowns where the dollar loses its monopoly as global currency reserve. The treasury bond is tarnished. The U.S. government is no longer believed as a uh, safe haven, downgrades in its debt, and the gold trade note is introduced for oil payments and other commerce. And that's the end of the dollar's kingdom. You cannot have a kingdom without, you, you cannot have a king without a kingdom to, to rule over. And that comes as a phrase from Basel. The, the dollar's kingdom is, is falling apart. They've lost Asia. We lost Pakistan recently. We're in the process of losing Saudi Arabia despite the uh, dog and pony sword show last June. What an absurdity that was. We're, we're losing our key allies. We're losing Germany right now. They're struggling with the Arab problem, the influx. But they're, they're just about ready to say, we're, we're not going to honor this Russian sanction nonsense anymore. I mean, the Nordstrom, Nord Stream 2 project for construction under the Baltic Sea and connecting a big second pipeline from Russia to Germany for industrial supply purposes, this is going to break the Russian sanctions. France is already breaking it. I don't know who's honoring it. 
we're already losing our kingdom. So it really comes down to when are we going to see a breakdown in the bond market? And will we start to get a number of very weird questions like, well, good night. We've seen hundreds of billions of treasuries sold. Shouldn't that bring the bond yield up two or three percent, not just 20 basis points? So the integrity of the U.S. Treasury bond market, I think, is going to go out the window soon. It's going to become widely recognized that interest rate swap derivatives are holding it together. People are going to start to wonder, with all these this supply coming on, a trillion mott or more this year in treasuries, plus all the bond dumping, who's buying this crap? Almost nobody. Japan Japan is is buying treasury bonds now to make sure <laughs> to make sure that their yen goes down. The, the, the Japanese have had a 20 year 30 year project, no, 26 year project, 1991, to make sure their yen currency does not go up too much. So they like buying treasury bonds. They now own more than China. China's been dumping a lot of them. Japan's been buying a little bit more recently. I think Japan needs to go on Infinite QE2, because <laughs> in September of 2014, when the United States stole their $1.2 trillion government pension fund in Japan, the response for the Bank of Japan was, we're going to go to infinite QE, because we're going to replace, we're going to hit two birds with one stone. We're going to replace the stolen treasury bonds, <clears throat> and we're going to go to infinite QE. Jim, do you think this transition that you're talking about, do you think this is going to happen um, with a crash of the economy here in the United States? Or do you think it will be a very slow transition and no one will really notice um, that all this is happening until it's too late? I think it's going to be gradual. I think it's going to be ugly. I, I think it's going to just slowly get more and more out of control. So you think you think this is going to be like more of a, a long draw a, a long drawn out type of thing where people really don't see it happening, but it's happening all in the background, and then one day they wake up and you know this has changed, this that has changed, and it's a little bit at a time, and before you know it, everyone's sitting there scratching their head, going, "What just happened here?" Well, you know, frogs boil slowly. And notice that what's happened in just the last couple of weeks in the United States is a lot of talk about buying the dip. So they're not really capturing a change in, in the structural nature of the U.S. financial situation. I think this can be a slow process. And a critical event in the United States is for the 10 year yield going over 3% and outside the United States for China buying Saudi oil and RMB. Those are the two big, big events. If both of those happen, you're going to start seeing a lot of Western financial analysts saying the dollar's kingdom has fallen apart. What's next? So those are the two signs that uh, people should be looking at right now to give them. S I, I, I can't think of anything more important. I mean, you can look at uh, certain nations shunning the uh, Russian sanctions or dumping a lot more treasury bonds. But until you see evidence <clears throat> in uh, in the 10 year yield, until you see evidence of actual trade taking place in RMB for the critically important oil sector. It doesn't really matter. You just, it's just music.